Thank you, Jorgen. Hello, everyone. I am Purnima. I am a PhD student at Illinois Institute of Technology. This talk is about understanding recursive divide and conquer approach for dynamic programs using fork join and data flow execution models. This work is in collaboration with my co-authors at Stony Brook University and University of Oklahoma. So first, uh, here is the outline for my talk. I'm going to start by introducing dynamic programming. I will show how two-way recursive divide and conquer algorithms are implemented. Then I will describe the issue with existing folk join programming models for implementing two-way recursive algorithms. And then I will explain how we can solve these issues by using a data flow programming model. And we are going to focus on into concurrent collections in this book. And then along with the experimental results, I'm also going to present an analytical model for understanding the data movement cost in recursive dynamic programs. So let's start with the uh, introduction to dynamic programming. Dynamic programming is a widespread. Uh, the dynamic programming algorithms are everywhere. They have applications in uh, bioinformatics, graph problems, compilers, natural language processing, and so on. So what is dynamic programming? It is an algorithmic technique for solving an optimization problem by breaking it down into smaller, simpler subproblems. So in computation with lots of overlapping subproblems, we do not want to recompute the same problem again and again, but instead we should be able to reuse the memory. So dynamic programming solves each subproblem exactly once and allows for reuse by storing the solutions in a table. For uh, it's, a, it's called a DP table. Now, every dynamic programming solution uh, it has a recurrence relation that specifies how and which subproblems we have to solve. So typically, uh, these dynamic programming algorithms are implemented using nested for loops. However, prior research from uh, the co-authors in this work has shown have shown that uh, the loop-based approaches have very good spatial locality and prefetching often improves performance. However, they do not have good temporal locality in the data access pattern. So by temporal locality, I mean uh, reusing the data. Uh, reusing the data within, within a short amount of time, for example. And then uh, spatial localities, uh, accessing data elements, uh, which are really uh, close, closer in the storage uh, space, right? like an array. Okay, so here I have a snippet, uh, a, a nested loop implementation of Gaussian elimination without theory. We're going to use uh, the Gaussian elimination algorithm as a running example throughout to understand the, the concepts. So what we can see here is in the top uh, snippet, there are three for loops for i, for k, for i, and for j. And the innermost loop is updating some cells in the DP table. So below here, we have a figure of the DP table, and it shows one example where the cell ij requires data above it from all the green cells above it, and from all the green cells to the left, and the green cells in the diagonal. So this data access pattern exists throughout the algorithm. So in this kind of data access pattern, you can see that there's no good temporal locality. We have to keep fetching these memory elements again and again in a loop-based implementation. But to solve the issue with poor temporal locality, several researchers have introduced classic two-way recursive algorithms. So here's an example of a recursive divide and conquer algorithm for Gaussian elimination. Here we have a matrix A and uh, the loop-based implementation is divided into four different functions. The, uh, this matrix A, uh, uh, sorry, the matrix X, function A is called on this matrix X. Now it recursively subdivides itself into four different submatrices. And then uh, function A gets called on the top left submatrix X11. Now after, after function A finishes executing, it calls function B and C on, the, on X1, X12 and X21 submatrices and uh, functions B and C can run in parallel at this point. And then after function B and C uh, finish executing, it calls function D to update the submatrix X22, which is the red box shown here in stage three. And after executing function D, function A gets called again here on this same subblock and the algorithm completes. So now uh, one thing to note here is that all the functions A, B, C, and D are recursive functions. So they keep calling themselves uh, again and again until we reach a base condition. And once the base condition is reached, uh, we execute the loop-based implementation that we see here. So now, this, uh, typically, these, uh, to implement these recursive dynamic programming algorithms, uh, people use fork join models like Silk and OpenMP. So let's see how that implementation would look like. So if, what we have here is, again, the same example, Gaussian elimination without pivoting, implemented using the fork join model. 
So now fork joint models have a structural property that limits the performance, limits the parallelism uh, in these recursive program, uh, recursive algorithms. So we'll see how that is the case. Now here we again have matrix X and function A gets called on the matrix. It gets recursively divided into four sub matrices and function A gets called on sub matrix X11. Now again, that gets recursively subdivided and let's say we have reached the base condition. So in stage one, we are executing function A on the red sub matrix that you see here. Now, after finishing function A, uh, we have to execute function, we can execute functions B and C in the sub matrices you see here in stage two. Now here again, function D executes, right, on the red sub matrix in stage three, and then function A executes at this point. This is the same thing we have seen before uh, uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the execution model, right? So after this, we reach a synchronization point. So in, for example, in OpenMP, if you're implementing this function A, there will be a task weight, which is a, a coarse grain synchronization point uh, that we have to reach this point to be able to finish computation on this whole submatrix X11, and then we can execute functions B and C. So here uh, we have functions B and C, all these blocks uh, that are shown in red can run in parallel in stages. But if you think about it, uh, if we think about the data dependencies between these functions, right after executing this stage one, updating the sub top left sub matrix, along with these two uh, sub sub blocks, the sub, sub the sub matrices in stage five and stage six are also ready to be executed. Okay, that. So you see the dotted boxes here. These these tasks are actually ready to be executed, but they are not able to get scheduled because of this coarse grain synchronization point in the fork joint uh, uh, execution model. Okay, so let's summarize what are the issues we saw with the fork joint model. So the first thing is that uh, fork join these coarse grained uh, synchronization points they create artificial dependencies. Now the tasks that were ready to execute right in stage five, they were not able to execute before. That's because of an artificial dependency that we created due to, due to the task weight that we have introduced in the book. Now, these artificial dependencies can increase the overall execution time. They, they can increase the span because they're not able to schedule the tasks that are ready to execute, right? And hence it reduces the overall parallelism also that is available. And then uh, it can also lead to resource underutilization because if we have more resources, more threads available, but we are not able to launch the tasks, then uh, uh, they have to just stay idle. So we uh, we would that would lead to resource underutilization. Now all these or uh, all these limitations can be overcome by using the data flow uh, implementation. So let's see how we can do that. So moving on to uh, the data flow implementation. Here I have. Uh, we are going to focus on Intel concurrent collections. Firstly, uh, what is data flow? It can be thought of as a directed graph of data that is flowing through uh, between operations. All the nodes in a directed graph can be thought of as operations, and then a data is flowing through between them. So there are a few different data uh, flow models out there, and uh, this programming paradigm is actually really emerging these days. But our focus in this work is on uh, Intel concurrent collections. Now, a CNC program, concurrent collections is uh, CNC in short, a CNC program can be thought of as a graph of computation nodes which are communicating with each other via data. So CNC, uh, CNC program can, uh, uh, can express different types of parallelism. It can express uh, task parallelism, data parallelism, loop parallelism, uh, pipeline parallelism, and so on. There are three main concepts in our CNC program. So they're called connections. So the first thing is step collections, which are the actual functions that get executed. Uh, the other one is tag collections, which are which are used to express control dependencies between these operations, these functions. And then we have the item collections, which is the data itself. So CNC uh, can also be thought of as a specification language where uh, the relationship between these functions, the graph components are specified statically once, and then dynamically during the run execution of the program, depending on the data, multiple instances of the uh, of these relations of these graphs uh, get generated. So for example, uh, going back to Gaussian elimination, so there's a dependency function B and C can execute only after function A has finished. So we define that dependency once, uh, and then multiple instances get created uh, depending on the input sub matrix that we get. Now, CNC specification also allows separation of concerns. By that, what I mean is, for example, if there's a domain expert who knows uh, how to write the algorithm, but doesn't know anything about the underlying resources or the architectures or how to optimize, they can just take care of the functionality and then the runtime experts, the tuning experts will actually 
uh, worry about how how can you map this computation onto the uh, underlying ar architecture? How do you load balance? And uh, how, how do you actually get good performance? Right. So the runtime experts can focus on that. So CNC actually takes care of that, where, uh, where the domain experts can only uh, focus on functionality. They don't have to uh, worry about the nitty gritty details of the runtime system. All right. So here I have. Uh, uh, I just want to show the CNC constructs that are available. So the listing here on the top describes the CNC constructs where uh, I have paired parentheses. This one stands for, uh, this is actually the uh, the uh, specific notification uh, notation they use uh, in CNC as well. This is the official notation. So here you have the paired parentheses, which stands for the step collections. Uh, we have the square brackets, which is for the data collection. And then the angled brackets are the tag collections. So a step collection, like I mentioned before, it's the actual function that gets executed, right? It updates, it reads and write item, writes items into the item collection, which has all the data. Now, tag collection is prescribes to a step collection. In CNC terms, it has to prescribe to a step collection to say that, okay, uh, this function can execute after a certain function or something. That relationship is expressed by putting a tag into the tag collection. So, here is how we would implement the Gaussian elimination algorithm using CNC. So, um, so now CNC can also, I just want to uh, uh, make a note that CNC can run on distributed memory as well, but we are focusing on shared memory uh, in this work. So as seen earlier, we have four functions, functions A, B, C, and D. Function A first runs to update the top left sub matrix, right? We put the tags and then the actual function runs and it generates some output. Uh, because this is a shared memory uh, implementation, we are not actually passing any data, but uh, it's putting tags uh, to let the, to invoke the other functions, the subsequent uh, functions in the tag. So after function A finishes execution, we have functions B and C that get executed. So uh, in a CNC program, now functions B and C, they call a get method. A get method uh, ensures that the previous tasks have finished executing, so now these functions can run. Now, uh, there are two versions of get method, uh, blocking get and non-blocking get. We have used blocking get in our uh, in, in all our implementations, but um, uh, and we have actually compared both uh, using non-blocking get and blocking get, and blocking get gave us faster execution time, so that's why we chose that. But technically, we can use any of them to implement uh, the algorithms. So after B and C have finished execution, now function D runs, and uh, uh, on the bottom right sub matrix here, and then puts the tags, where we have to run function A again on the bottom right to finish the execution, right? Okay, so before we go there, um, so one thing I want to, uh, the main thing we should note here is that there are no post grain synchronization points like we have seen in the fourth join model, right? Uh, which is the main advantage of using the data flow model. So for example, if the top left submatrix uh, has done, the computation on the top left submatrix is done, all the tasks that depend on that one submatrix will get launched and the CNC runtime can, uh, uh, can schedule those, those tasks. So this kind of uh, uh, data flow model overcomes the limitation of having post grain synchronization points that we see in fourth join model and which cannot be avoided. So this way we can extract more parallelism and improve the overall and can improve the overall uh, performance uh, of the, of the uh, algorithms. All right, now CNC also provides uh, tuners which can pass hints to the runtime system to improve the performance of the program. And uh, the good thing is that this requires very minimal changes in, uh, it, it, we just need to declare some collections uh, inherit from some uh, interfaces and stuff like that, but it requires very minimal changes to incorporate this into an already existing program, and it helps in improve, improving performance by providing hints to the runtime. Now, uh, CNC provides several different tuners, like you can thin threads to cores, and there are several different tuners, but we have used two for our evaluation purposes in this work. The first one is the pre-scheduled tuner, which tells the runtime to schedule a task only after all the dependencies have been satisfied. So it does a, a prior analysis before the execution of the program. So if a task has two inputs, if only one input arrives and we schedule the task, we are just waiting for the other task to finish, right? So we don't want to do uh, that to happen in waste resources. So it uh, tells the runtime to schedule the task only after all the dependencies have been satisfied. Uh, the other one is a manual tuner where we manually create all the tasks in the beginning and leave it up to the runtime to decide on the placement of the tasks and the scheduling and all the other details. All right, so that was a brief overview of CNC and how we can resolve the issue uh, that we see with the port joint programming model. Right. So now moving on to the evaluation, uh, we have benchmarked three different uh, applications here. The first one is Gaussian elimination without pivoting, which we have been uh, looking at the whole time. Uh, the second one is Smith-Waterman, 
algorithm. So this algorithm uh, is used for determining similarity between two DNA sequences. It's like a string matching algorithm. The third one is Floyd Walsh's all pairs shortest paths, uh, which computes the shortest path between all pairs of vertices in a given directed graph. All right, so for every benchmark, uh, we have created four versions of uh, the uh, programs. The first one is a native CNC, which is the basic CNC program which, uh, without any scheduling needs. The second one is the tuner CNC, which uh, uses the pre-scheduled tuner I mentioned earlier. Third one is the manual CNC, which is a manually pre-scheduled CNC program where we create all the tasks in the beginning and then uh, let the runtime handle it. And the fourth one is the OpenMP tasking. So we compare uh, the CNC with OpenMP, which is a fork join model. And uh, we're using the GNU OpenMP uh, uh, here for, uh, for the execution, for the evaluation. All right, so as per the experimental setup, we have picked two many core machines for evaluation. Uh, the, these machines are part of uh, Mystique test bed at Illinois Institute of Technology. Um, so the first one is AMD EPIC. It has 64 cores in total. The other one is a Skylake machine with 192 cores. Um, both of them have eight numa zones and uh, uh, same L1 cache of 32K, and uh, they differ in L2 and L3 cache sizes. All right, so before I show any results, I would like to briefly discuss an analytical model that we came up with to understand the performance of DP algorithms. Now, why did we do this? Because a super accurate model does not exist for understanding the performance uh, of these recursive uh, algorithms today. So. Uh, so here again, we use the example of Gaussian elimination, uh, but it can really be generalized to any uh, DP algorithm based on the same uh, ideas. So what we do here is for the analytical model, firstly, we compute the total number of tasks that the algorithm is generating. So, uh, so equation one uh, shows the number of tasks. Here we have a matrix of size N and the base size is, uh, for the recursive algorithm is M by M. And uh, this equation gives the total number of tasks. Now, this equation, uh, it doesn't look straightforward, but it can be easily obtained by looking at the uh, loop-based implementation. We have those three uh, for K, for I, for J. We just do a summation on the loop based on the loop bounds. And there is one operation, one task happening inside the innermost loop. So if we do that summation, we get this uh, equation, the total number of tasks. Once we have that, now we move on to calculate the maximum cache misses per process. So we know we have a triply nested loop uh, uh, in the loop is in the uh, base implementation in each task, right? And uh, the in the triply nested loop is accessing memory uh, elements Cij, Cik, Ckj, and Ckk. Let's say, okay. So now the maximum cache misses can be obtained by using this equation. Now again, this. Uh, uh, is uh, obtained uh, again by looking at the for loop, the nested loop implementation. Here I will explain the first uh, uh, term, which is two times this whole thing, represents the number of cache misses incurred when accessing elements C, I, J, and C, K, J. The second term here represents, accounts for the cache misses uh, for accessing C, I, K. And the third term is for accessing elements C, K, K. Okay, so more details uh, are in the paper if you're interested uh, uh, on how we arrive at this equation. But uh, what we're doing here is we're counting the total number of memory elements accessed for each distinct array reference divided by the cache line size L here. So if you are using, uh, calculating cache misses for L1 or L2 or L3, we use that size over here. And then we get, this gives us an upper bound of the total, cache, uh, total number of cache misses that we can incur for every task. Okay, now given the number of cache misses, uh, one thing we are assuming here is a fair distribution of tasks across processes. Now, in a real uh, in a real execution, there would be uh, try, uh, the load would be uh, not very balanced, right? Not every processor gets an equal a fair share of tasks. But that is an assumption we have uh, uh, taken here in the analytical model that every processor executes the same number of tasks, and then we use those number of tasks and uh, the cache miss penalty for every level of cache uh, and the clock frequency, of course, to convert. The number of cache misses into time. So, how much time are we spending uh, for uh, for this data moment? For the and this gives us an upper bound of the maximum cache misses that we can expect from this algorithm. All right. So, uh, so the pink line. So now we move on to the results. Uh, these results are for the Gaussian elimination. So what we did in the analytical model is we estimated the time for the data moment, the cost, right, for the, from the cache misses that we can get. And we plotted it here. So we are not predicting the exact uh, execution time here, but we are trying to understand at what point we lose performance or 
get those kind of insights, so which I will talk about more uh, further. So what we have here is the results for Gaussian elimination on both the machines, Epic and uh, Skylake. Uh, we have evaluated different matrix sizes, 2K, 4K, 8K, 16K, but I'm presenting only a few results here. Uh, the rest are in the paper. So here in all these graphs, the x-axis shows the base size for the recursive algorithm. The y-axis shows uh, the execution time and lower is better, obviously. Now, the estimated time using the analytical model is the pink line that you can see in all these graphs. What we see here is for smaller problem sizes. So here's the 2K matrix on Epic and 2K matrix on Skylake. We see that the data flow implementation actually beats fork join model, right? For smaller problem sizes. This is because the fork join model due to the coarse grain synchronization points is not able to feed all the cores. It's not able to provide the work uh, required for all the resources we have. So that is why data flow beats the performance here. However, if you look at the bigger matrix size, we have many more tasks because we are looking at the same base sizes. We have many more tasks. So OpenEP actually performs better until 512 base size, after which, again, uh, because of the course drain tasks and not having enough tasks to feed all the course, uh, data flow wins at this point. Now, uh, one thing I want to mention here is you can see that the analytical model uh, overshoots sometimes and undershoots sometimes. So there are a few reasons for this, because the first thing is we do not take into account the load imbalance that's being caused. We are assuming the a fair distribution of task, tasks all across. And then uh, the maximum cache misses we use to calculate, they're estimating the upper bound. If that, that is not the case in a real execution. You get low, you can get lower cache misses as well. So, so it, uh, it sometimes overshoots, sometimes undershoots, but it gives us a good idea of what, the ex what we can expect from the algorithm. So I will talk more about it later. All right, so here we have uh, the results for Smith-Waterman algorithm. Uh, main takeaway from these plots is, again, it's a wavefront type of parallelism and the folk join model OpenMP due to its artificial dependencies. It is not able to feed all the cores or generate all the tasks um, at, uh, uh, to uh, uh, fully utilize the resources. So even as we scale up the problem size, here I have results for only 16K matrix. We have all the results in the paper, but uh, uh, OpenMP is not able to generate enough tasks. So it loses in performance. Uh, it, it results in less performance uh, consistently for all the base sizes. And uh, all the variants of C and C perform similar, particularly for this benchmark. We have not observed any significant uh, performance differences there. All right. So these are the results for Floyd Washels on fresh shortest paths. Again, I have uh, only one matrix size uh, here, uh, 8K matrix. Uh, so one thing here is the analytical model that I described earlier for Gaussian elimination can also be applied for this algorithm because the data access patterns are similar in both algorithms. And uh, they have the same computational uh, complexity, three nested for loops and uh, big O of n cube and similar data access patterns. Now, again, uh, we observe the same thing as we saw in Gaussian elimination that OpenMP is able to feed all the cores up to a base size of 512. But as you, uh, as you uh, increase the base size, uh, OpenMP is not able to end, uh, generate enough tasks because of the coarse grained synchronization points and uh, it loses performance. So here is an important, uh, uh, interesting uh, thing I want to highlight that we uh, learned from the analytical model. So what we see here is uh, the measure of temporal locality. We have we estimated the maximum cache misses using the analytical model, and then we measured the actual cache misses for Gaussian elimination using Pappy library. And then if you take the ratio of the maximum over the actual, you get a measure of temporal locality. So that is what we are seeing in this table for different base sizes. Uh, this we have done on the 8K matrix. So what we see here is the green, uh, the higher the temporal locality, uh, the higher the ratio, higher the temporal locality. So better the performance, right? So what we are seeing is the temporal locality is high for base size 64 and 128. And after that, it sharply drops. And this is the thing we observed in the experiments as well, that we get the best running time at 128 base size, and then we start losing performance. Uh, as far as L3 cache is concerned, uh, the ratio is pretty high for most problem sizes, so it's not really an issue here. But this is an interesting observation we could make from uh, by using the analytical model that we developed. All right, so that's all for the evaluation. That brings us to the uh, conclusion. So I would like to summarize by saying that uh, we highlighted the important differences between data flow and folk join models for implementing two-way recursive divide and conquer algorithms. We showed how artificial dependencies can cause a loss in performance. We presented the lessons we learned and on three important dynamic programming benchmarks. Uh, we also presented an analytical model, which can be easily extended to other dynamic programming algorithms for understanding the performance. For uh, regarding future work, the first thing we would like to do is extend this work to distributed memory parallel runtimes and do more analysis uh, on the performance. Uh, we are also interested in looking at other algorithms other than uh, outside of dynamic programming. 
And uh, one other thing is the polyhedral compiler transformation, where you can automatically transform the loops uh, using tiling and generation of parallel loops. You can automatically transform them into a data flow model uh, using these compiler transformations. So because it takes some a little bit of an effort to convert an OpenMP tasking program into a data flow model. So this would also be really interesting to do. Um, so yeah, that's all I have. And I'll open it up to questions. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you for the talk. Um, so there was a question from Jen. And Jen is asking, is equation two equivalent to assuming no cache reuse? And does CNC improve over fork join in that measure? Um, okay, so here, what we're assuming here is that uh, we have a very small cache. So we are already taking that into account that we have a very small cache available. Only three elements can fit into the cache. So I think uh, the assumption here is that we have a set of associative cache. And uh, if we have 32K L1 size, we are uh, using only one fourth of the cache, right? So it's really giving us the maximum number of uh, cache misses by using this equation. Um, so. All right. Okay. So thank you. Yeah. So that was basically yeah. the only question. Thank you. So in that sense, that closes also our session.